We believe the original door would have been there in the center, and it would have been just this one room, and that's it. Over here, they would have had in a, a, a bed with uh, wooden panels around it to keep them warm at night. This would have been the kitchen. Now, what happens is this is the way it probably looked back in the 1660s. When the grandson adds the uh, addition in 1795, he will, put, he will move the working kitchen there and turn this into a living room kitchen. So this fireplace is a uh, uh, 1790s fire addition, fireplace addition that he put onto the house later when he remodeled it. Um, but what's interesting about it are, for example, these things, which are called drying drawers. You put tobacco leaves inside, and then you close it, and the heat of the fireplace dries it out, so you have tobacco to smoke. Uh, so this, that was all part of the British style. The beams are original. Everything in here is original. The plaster we have to take down eventually to see what's underneath. But over here, we have broken into it, and you can see the insulation on the inside of the uh, house. It's made out of clay and mud and hair. Here's some more of it. This, see, it's all this. And that's what made the house uh, cool in the win uh, summer and warm in the winter. Uh, it, it's a kind of insulation, actually, that they still use in China, in some of the more traditional homes in, um, in, in, in China. Over here is a diagram. We did a, what they call a study of the beams and everything. And so this is how the house grew. As I said, you're in this room, which was the original farmhouse. Then in 1669, this, uh, the part was added, and the back end for his offices were added. And then in 1795, that middle section where he moved the kitchen over to here, and then in 1845, they raised the roof and then they added the final part. So we have kind of a whole history of the building of the house, which is kind of unique, I think. Um, I, I thought that was the, like the whole thing when it grew and grew and grew. Yeah, when it grew and grew and grew, <laughs> yes, right. And this is kind of a picture of what you see now. That's an old picture from the 1700s of the house. That was a sketch. Okay, so now what's important about this house is actually, uh, this room is actually the history of this place. Okay, so now we go back to the history part. John Bowne marries Hannah Feek. They move in here. Uh, before that, though, Kiefert, who is the director general over in New York, is replaced by Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant is an old military sergeant, and he wants everybody to live according to his rules, uh, an early form of um, Trump. Uh, <laughs> and so he starts persecuting, he starts persecuting the Quakers. The people in Flushing get very upset. They say, you can't do that. He says, in our charter, it says people can live here the way they want to, according to their conscience, as long as they don't disturb anybody else. So they write a document uh, in 1652, uh, the year that John Bowne actually arrives in Boston, they send it to him, and the remonstrance is a fancy word for reminder, reminding him that he can't do this. Now this flushing remonstrance becomes one of the documents that Jefferson and uh, Franklin and Washington will look at when they make the Constitution. And they'll say, hey, we should have this as part of our structure also in the United States. So this is considered to be the starting point of religious freedom in the United States. Now what happens is Hannah Feek is actually a Quaker preacher. So when Hannah and, and John move in here, he's not a Quaker yet, he, be, he will become a Quaker, he's not a Quaker yet, but she is. They start holding Quaker meetings in this room. So Stuyvesant has him arrested and sent in 1662 to the Netherlands to stand trial for not listening to the Director General. But he is acquitted there because they say, wait a minute, it's in the charter. They're allowed to practice whatever they want to according to their conscience. And so he's acquitted and he comes back. And ironically, the year he comes back is when the British take over and the Dutch lose the territory altogether. So Stuyvesant is retired. He, he retires to uh, Mark's Place, St. Mark's Place in Manhattan, uh, uh, the Bowery, uh, St. Mark's Church. That was his private chapel. That was his farm. And he's buried there. So you can go visit his tomb if you want or his grave if you want to. But the important thing is that this room then becomes the Quaker meeting house for the next 30 years. This precedes Penn and Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, because uh, Penn doesn't come over until 1681. But from 1662 until 1695, uh, 1693 actually, this is where the Quakers met. So not only is this place the starting point of religious freedom, it's also the beginning of the Quaker religion in the United States. In fact, George Fox, who is the founder of the Quakers, comes here and stays. 
and he preaches. And across the street, when you leave, go across the street, and you'll see over on the next block over a stone, pyramid stone that marks the place where George Fox preached while he was here. So many people came that they couldn't do it inside. They did it outside. So he did the preaching under the oaks is what they said. Um, so it's, as I say, besides being kind of religious freedom, also the start of the Quaker religion. John Bowne himself will help to build the first Quaker meeting house, which is over on Northern Boulevard, uh, in 1693. He will die in 1695, but a couple years before that, he helps to build that, them to build that. So then they move from there to there. So that's why this is kind of a historical, significant space, if you will, for a couple of reasons. So who wrote the remonstrance? The people in Flushing, who were not Quakers. Okay. There were 19 families that put it together. There was a secretary that was in charge. In fact, the, um, the armory, which is on Northern Boulevard, is the place where there was a tavern. And it was at that tavern that the remonstrance was uh, signed. Okay. Uh, because that's where all the public stuff was done. You know, public meetings were held in the local taverns and everything like that. So uh, Scully, I believe, was the guy's name who was the secretary who put, actually put it together. But the 19 signers of it, none of them were Quakers. Okay. They just said, we, you can't do this because be our charter says people can live here. Uh, free. So it, it also ended up being applied to the Jewish people because there was a, a group of, uh, uh, there was a boat full of Jewish people that came from Brazil. And they landed in New Amsterdam and Stuyvesant chased them away. So I don't want any Jews here either. So he chased them away. Um, but then they eventually came back also on this principle. Interesting. So. There's a lot of historical significance. So these 19 people, they wrote the, they wrote the letter, and then who did the letter go to? It went to Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant. It was a reminder to him because okay. he was the director general of the, the New Netherlands. The New yeah. Netherlands was the whole Dutch territory. Okay. It's, he's, his offices were in Manhattan at New Amsterdam, uh, but he was in charge of the whole kit and caboodle. Okay. And so he wanted everybody to live the way they were. He wanted everybody to belong to the Dutch Reformed Church yeah. is basically what he wanted. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it was... But, it was um, so it was Flushing under New, New Netherlands, or was it under? No, it's under New Netherlands. Okay. It was under New Netherlands, but it was filled with British people. Okay. Uh, the British came and settled in five different communities: Newton, Jamaica, Flushing, Hempstead, and Oyster Bay. They would come. And they were all British. They were all English, but they came, and those were, but that, those towns were in the New Netherlands territory. The Dutch didn't want to come. The, the, the uh, Dutch West Indies Company yeah, ran right, the place. Right, right. And they couldn't get Dutch people to come because the Dutch were more comfortable at home. They didn't want to go out in the middle of the woods. <laughs> they, they had all of their money and their wealth and good food and nice things back in, in, in the Netherlands. And so the Netherlands, the Dutch West Indies Company, started to invite whoever wanted to come. Well, the British, the English, who came and went, as I said, to Boston and then found the Puritans, didn't want to live that way. They wanted to be more British than that. So then they started to make settlements in the Dutch territories. Uh, and so they founded these different towns. So was the, uh, was the, the religious freedom... See, I, I always thought it, it was because of uh, the Dutch West Indies Company had that provision. That it, it did. It did. Okay. It did. And then it was applied to the Flushing Charter. Okay. okay. And but so and the, so the okay. people in Flushing said, "Wait a minute, it, this is part of our charter, which does come from the Dutch West okay. Indies okay. Company okay. charter itself." Okay. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So yes, then. Hello. Hi. Okay. So did you open the case?